Good morning to everyone. How are you? That was a low rumble. Uh, welcome to each of you to Christ Church to our service this morning. It's wonderful to see a full auditorium and uh, all those shining masks looking back at me. Please uh, remember during the service uh, to keep your mask on, gel properly, and uh, let's keep everyone safe. Uh, I'd like to begin the service this morning with, with an opening prayer. Holy Father, we come to you this morning thanking you and believing and trusting that you are present with us. We hope that our worship to you and to your Son, our Lord Jesus, that it will be acceptable and that it will be in spirit and in truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Please let's stand for our first hymn, Waymaker. You are. 
stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Way make a miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God. That is who you are. Way make a miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God. That is who you
seated. How I wish each one of you could be up here and hear the power of your voices roll forward. Uh, it sounds a lot better up here than it does sitting from the back, trust me. Let's um, each of us prepare our hearts as we collectively enter a time of prayer and prepare your hearts as we approach God's wonderful throne of mercy and approach His presence. Holy Father, we have assembled together this morning by your gift of faith that you have given us through your Son, Jesus. We approach your throne of grace with boldness, knowing that you hear us, Lord. Through the gift of your Son and what he accomplished in his death, you brought him through death and out the other side to new creation, to a new covenant, and to a new world. And it's by this gift of faith that we believe him and we trust him that he too will raise us up on that day. Father, we want to bring before you the names of people that we know who are sick among us. They need your help of healing, comfort, and encouragement. We're mindful of Steve and Marie Good as they continue to recover from, from COVID. We're also mindful of Opus and David Eastgate as they too are recovering from this virus. And there are others, Holy Father, in our assembly who need your comfort, who are going through sickness and trouble. Father, regarding this city, Bangkok, where you have brought each of us to, we remember your words spoken through your servant, Jeremiah, when he spoke to your ancient people who were exiled to Babylon. Through your prophet, you spoke to your people saying, seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you and pray to the Lord on its behalf for in its welfare, you will find your welfare. And also the words you had for your follower, Paul, when he fearfully entered the city of Corinth to proclaim the good news, we're mindful and thankful of the words that you spoke to him and that you speak to us. Don't be afraid, for I have many people in this city. Father, we pray for Bangkok and for the city's welfare and our welfare as we live here. We too believe that you have many of your people here. Therefore, empower us to proclaim the good news in Bangkok and to use each of us that we may help find your scattered children to bring them home. Lord, we know in this world we have trouble. If it were not true, you would have told us. You comfort us by your word saying, don't be afraid. I'm with you, even to the end of this age. We wait for you, Lord Jesus. We, we long for your appearing when you will set all things in the right and make all things new with your promise. For the former things 
death, sorrow, weeping, and weariness will all pass away. To hear your voice when you say, look, I am making all things new. We long for that day, Lord, for the sun, the noonday sun is, is hot and the nights are long. We lay our prayer and our request before you, Father in heaven, and it's in the name of your Son, our King Jesus. Amen. The first Bible reading is from Nehemiah, chapter 6, verses 1 through 9. Nehemiah, chapter 6, 1 to 9. When word came to Sanbarat, Tobias, Geshem, the Arab, and the rest of our enemies that I had rebuilt the wall and not a gap was left in it, tore up. To that time, I had not set the doors in the gates. Sanbarat and Geshem sent us this message. Come, let us meet together in one of the village on the plan of Ono. But they were scheming to harm me, so I sent messengers to them with the reply, I am carrying on a great project and cannot go down. Why should the work stop Why I have to let to it and go down to you? Four times they sent me the same message, and each time I gave them the same answer. Then the fifth time, Sanbarat sent him as to me with the same message, and in this time was an unsealed letter in which was written. It is reported among the nations, and Geshem said it is true, that is, you and the Jews are plotting to revolt, and therefore you are building the wall. Moreover, according to their reports, you are about to become their king, and have even appointed prophets to make this proclamation about you in Jerusalem. There is a king in Judah. Now this report will get back to the king. So come, let us meet together. I sent him this reply. Nothing like what you are saying is happening. You are like making it up out of your head. They were all trying to frighten us, thinking their hands will get to weak for the work, and it will not be completed. But I pray, God strengthen my hands. This is the word of the Lord. The second Bible reading is from Nehemiah, chapter 6, verses 10 to 19. One day I went to the house of Shemaiah, son of Deliah, the son of Mehetabel, who was shut in at his home. He said, let us meet in the house of God inside the temple, and let us close the temple doors because men are coming to kill you. By night they are coming to kill you. But I said, should a man like me run away or should someone like me go into the temple to save his life? I will not go. I realized that God had not sent him, but that he had prophesied against me because Tobiah and Sanballat had hired him. He had been hired to intimidate me so that I would commit a sin by doing this. And then they would give me a bad name to discredit me. Remember Tobiah and Sanballat, my God, because of what they have done. Remember also the prophet Nadiah and how she and the rest of the prophets have been trying to intimidate me. So the wall was completed on the 25th of Elu in 52 days. When all our enemies heard about this, all the surrounding nations were afraid and lost their self-confidence. 
because they realized that this work had been done with the help of our God. Also, in those days, the nobles of Judah were sending many letters to Tobiah, and replies from Tobiah kept coming to them. For many in Judah were under oath to him, since he was son-in-law to Shechaniah, son of Era, and his son Johanan had married the daughter of Mishalim, son of Berechiah. Moreover, they kept reporting to me his good deeds and then telling him what I said. And Tobiah sent letters to intimidate me. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Good morning. I am happy to be able to share with you this morning, and I'm thankful that Vicar Matthew has uh, chosen this, this, this whole theme with Nehemiah uh, over the past weeks and uh, the coming weeks. And uh, just to tell you, about five weeks ago, he asked me if I would try to tackle this passage, and I've worked on it. I've at one time, I had about 12, 14 pages of notes, and my darling wife said, are you writing a book or a sermon? And I tried to reassure her I was doing a, a sermon. And so I've eliminated, and I've even done like the Apostle Paul, I've written it in big print, so you might see it. So even though I have about uh, nine slides this morning, uh, it's in big print. And uh, it's, it's for our good. I have a number of illustrations here that I'll get to. But I want to start first this morning with a, a little quiz, just to make sure you're all on your toes. Anybody can tell me how many books in the Bible? How many books in the Bible? If you're from America, you should remember because there is a highway from Chicago down to Los Angeles that's very famous around the world called Route 66, 66 books in the Bible. Now, what is the sweetest mountain in the Bible? The Mount of Olives, good, 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 but not the answer I'm, I'm looking for. Someone said uh, the Calvary where Jesus died, definitely one of the sweetest places on earth. But the sweetest mountain in the Bible is Mount Carmel. And then lastly, your last quiz question. Who was the shortest man in the Bible? Zacchaeus? No, it wasn't Zacchaeus. Who else? What about our, the man that wrote this book? Nehemiah. Could it, could it be? No, it isn't him. There's one shorter than Nehemiah, Job's friend, Bildad the Shuhite. Oh, it's, it's almost a, an old vicar joke, isn't it? I'll, I'll try to leave those alone. I want to review with you just for a moment who this guy Nehemiah is because it's so important and I've been drawn to it over and over and over again over the last weeks. And as I look at each chapter and have reread all the way through and all the way through in different versions, I keep seeing this. It keeps coming. And I can't see the slide, so uh, we'll go to the next one. Next slide, please. Charles Swindoll, the great American expositor and author who's written hundreds of books and preached hundreds of sermons, did a series on the book of Nehemiah, and then he did a short series for uh, a conference that he was asked to speak at on leadership. And he says there are three things that stand out about the man, Nehemiah. A box, a box of tissues is one because he was very sympathetic and empathetic. He was very compassionate. He had compassion for the holy city and he wanted to see it restored. He had compassion, he had sympathy for the people who had gone back out of exile and were living there and were in horrible condition. He, he was very compassionate as he took on in his ministry then, so to speak, that he um, took care of the people who were needy 
that were living in Jerusalem and helped them. So he was a very compassionate man. Swindoll says he also was a, a good way to remember him is through uh, the hard hat because he was the engineer, he was the architect, he was the designer who had this whole project in mind to go back and rebuild the wall around Jerusalem and then rebuild the city and rebuild the temple. So the hard hat is very important. And by the way, if you've not noticed one Bangkok uh, down here, oh my goodness, it's amazing, isn't it? But nothing as amazing, because they have all this equipment, nothing as amazing as what Nehemiah did and how he did it. And so the third thing Swindoll says that represents the life and the uh, outreach of Nehemiah was a brick. And I want to thank uh, Ozzy, who's here someplace, for the use of his hard hat and for uh, Joe at Conkey's Bakery for loaning me a brick. Uh, and I have some other thanks that I probably need to give out. But uh, he, he was not only one who you know, oversaw the building with those huge rocks. But he was also one as he led by example and would say to those standing by me, hand me another brick, hand me another stone, hand me some more mortar. I am not too good to get my hands dirty. I will lead by example. So that's one of the things that Swindoll says we need to remember. You know, there are a number of hats in this passage that uh, are represented, and I'm not sure, there we go. And these hats, uh, it's, 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 it's a phrase that we use in, in English. Uh, uh, you know, uh, he's a man of many hats. Uh, I have this hat from Penang back a couple of months ago, the end of May. Jabanda and I went there for our wedding anniversary. and. Um, uh, so she wanted this hat because it has her birth year on it. So it represents me as a husband. Nehemiah, we don't know in his autobiography, this book of Nehemiah, we don't know whether he was married, he had children, not a lot that we know about him. Uh, I'm a missions executive, and one of the things that uh, we do is we have a project down in Phuket on the beaches there and in the uh, uh, area uh, that is less... Uh, lived in mostly by local ties for this for the kids to come and play so the uh, tally this represents my ministry there and uh, this past week I've been trying to find a man new football hat and they are not to be found now I did find that uh, Liverpool hats are what we'd say in America a dime a dozen a bot a dozen uh, because who would want to buy them after that whomping that they got? I anyway, I couldn't find a man new hat, but I do have my L.A. Dodgers cap to remind me of where my roots are, and even though man new is my favorite team. And then I have my grandfather's cap, who my grandkids would say, Baba, go get your cap, let's go for a walk. Let's go to the park and play. And so these are just some of the hats. So we all have different hats, but Nehemiah had a number of hats. Some of them I have already uh, shown you, and others I will show you in just a moment. And these hats represent a number of things. Nehemiah's book is an autobiography. He writes it, and he tells us that he is basically, he sees himself in three ways, three phases to his life. The first, he is a cup bearer to the king. Now this is probably more symbolic during his day, but in our day, this one is probably more symbolic. Uh, he may have had to sample the king's coffee before he was able to uh, uh, drink it. And that, that's a very important role. You see, other than the queen, there was nobody closer to the king than his cupbearer. He's the guy who, after sipping it, would either say it's okay or he would be on the floor and they'd be carrying him out and the king would be looking for another cup bearer. He's the one who would take a grapao and taste it before the king did and say it's okay or <coughs> he'd been poisoned. And so uh, his, he sees himself and that's how he starts at chapter one as the cup bearer. And then he does see himself 
as the hard hat, as the engineer of this whole project because he has recruited the king. He's recruited the king to recruit soldiers and write papers and documents giving him permission to go check on his holy city, Jerusalem. And then the third thing that he tells us he is, he is the governor of the city of Jerusalem for about 15 years. And uh, the king trusted him to go and to do his work, but then the king made him the governor. And so, just so you can see, Pat, what does this say? Love, love the go. So today I'm your go. So you have to, you have to love me today, okay? No matter what I say, even though it may not, uh, you may not be uh, happy with it. But uh, the Lord Mayor of London has a hat that he wears to certain things, and Fari and Amir made this for me. Uh, it would have taken her months to make a hat like the Lord Mayor of London, but his medallion, that's a little easier. The Star of David and Love the Gov Jerusalem is uh, what he tells us his hat is during that last portion of his life. In addition to this, he was also a soldier, and we could use a sword to represent that. He's a God follower. He is, in almost every commentary that you read, he is a layman. He is not a priest like Ezra. He is not a prophet like Jeremiah. He is a common man who has compassion for his city. And unfortunately, from chapter 2 to chapter 13, he encounters fear and intimidation, and the people encounter fear and intimidation. Jeff's prayer this morning talked about fear his, uh, and how we, we, don't, we shouldn't be afraid. He even quoted some of the verses that I've had in mind as well. The songs we sang point us as followers of God not to be fearful, and yet the world we live in is such a fearful place. Well, another thing that he was not just a man of God in that he was uh, uh, into the Word, he knew what God's Word said, he was a man of prayer. I have a kneeler here from our, our church uh, representing the fact that he devoted himself, he committed himself, he gave himself to prayer. And when you look at it, the big picture, the greatest tool we have against fear is that last one, prayer. Are you feeling fearful? Are you feeling like you need a lift from the Lord? Then pray. He was not a priest like Ezra, who is in the latter part of this book. But he is not a Pharisee, he's not a scribe, he's not a Sadducee. If you put that in our terms, he's not a member of the PCC. He's not in the Archdiocese office in Singapore. He's just a common guy who has compassion and obeys God when God gives him this task of rescuing his city. The world is plagued with fear this morning. Oh my goodness. Intimidation by governments. Intimidation by Satan. Nehemiah says this himself. From Satan, my enemies, my friends, my religious leaders, and the politicians all have tried to intimidate me and put fear in me and put fear in the people. Almost 50,000 have now returned to the city of Jerusalem. So today, if we went out for coffee afterwards and talked or had lunch, some of these things might come up. Inflation. There's a lot of folk who are fearful of inflation. COVID. Still, the, the fear of COVID is amazing. Now we have a new monkeypox. Fear. We mentioned China in, in Asia, and there's lots of talk about fear. We mention Russia around the world, and there's talk of fear and famine because of Russia and drought that has set in and causing many fires, global warming and climate change. 
Those things are all fear. And the way that I get around the global warming and the climate change fear, although I believe that we as Christians are stewards of our earth and we should take care of it and we should do what we can. When I go to Phuket and I swim at the beach at Bangtao, I'm always coming back with plastic bags and bottles. And Kunji, the, the owner of the little resort, what well, if you shout? cleansing the ocean again. Don't you know it'll be back? It might be back, but I at least have taken this much out. So I'm, I'm all for our being aware of the climate and doing our best as God's stewards. But I also am reminded what Peter says in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 10. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night in which the heavenly bodies will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. The only thing that will last are those who follow and obey Jesus Christ. The earth isn't going to be here someday, uh, if, if I take this literally. But that's another fear now, isn't it? Oh my goodness, maybe this is God's way of, of ending the earth, of the second ushering in the second coming. If so, I have another thing to be concerned about. No, you don't, if you have the blood of Jesus Christ on your heart and on your life. It may be the end, but it may be, I, I'm not saying it is. I'm not saying it's even my opinion. I'm just saying something to think about and to help us focus on more important things. And that's what we're trying to do today, looking at this. Jesus says, with all these fears, that my peace I give you, fear not, do not be afraid. This phrase of, about fear applies, uh, is, is it 40 times, at least 40 times in the scripture. This doesn't even count the ones where Jesus talks about don't worry. When you're fearful, read God's word. When you're fearful, go to him in prayer. Don't let the circumstance around you cause you to be fearful. They're fear mongers. And they are many, even in the book of Nehemiah. So God has a task for us, and it's to not be fearful. And verse 2 through 4 of this passage that we heard talks about that we shouldn't be discouraged. And prayer, God's word, wise counsel, fellowship, worship and praise, these are all tools that we have available to us to help overcome fear and intimidation. I went to a conference in 1994 in London at the Fuller Estate, and it was led by a British BBC newscaster. We spent two weeks with him, and it was about leadership in missions. And he said, here's what I've learned, and I hope you will take away. Number one is you have to have a vision as a mission leader. You have to want to see God's glory like Nehemiah did. He wanted to see the glory of God return to Jerusalem. You have to have a mission. And his mission, Nehemiah's, was to rebuild the holy city, the walls, and the temple. He had goals. They were measurable. His goals were to survey the city within one week, to challenge the people within two weeks. His objectives were to secure the city, to protect the people, to restore a sense of pride and normalcy. And then finally, number five, he had a strategy. Nehemiah's strategy appeared to be, at least at this point, he designed work teams, he he designed security teams. He had even developed a warning system, a warning siren. He had one of the the guys who played the what's that thing called? I can't remember. Anyway, it's a big horn. It's a horn of an animal, and and uh, you play it, and it sounds, you can hear it everywhere. And so he had this, he carried, or this guy walked with him, and so if they saw an attack coming, he was to blow the horn, and all the people were to drop their bricks and pick up their swords, go to the wall, protect the city. Uh, it's, it's easy when you have a strategy, and you, you have all these five, to say yes to projects that are problems that come your way, but also to say no. And that's what I had a difficult time with for a long time, saying no. I heard all of these heart-wrenching requests. How do you say no to that? By having a strategy. 
that helps keep you on task. And that's what Nehemiah did. Each time they came to him and said, oh, you, you must meet with us. No, I can't. I'm doing a great task for the Lord. He's called me. It's more important than meeting with you. Last week, I got an email from a foundation in, Mer in America asking for uh, me to send them some information about how they could support our ministry in Thailand. And so what I did was I copied and pasted our mission vision and our mission statement and sentence number three was our mission strategy. The next morning from the administrator, the director's secretary, I received this note. Gary, the director and the board are thrilled and excited about your strategy and about your mission. Expect the first check next month. Now, I didn't have to do a lot of work because I'd already thought it through. I already had it written down. I already was, I, I was already on the page and prepared for that. So was Nehemiah. He was prepared for them. He was prepared for the fear mongers. He was prepared to, uh, when they came at him. We need to be discerning, and I think we're at a different slide, I'm not sure. If, if something is said, we need to be like Jeremiah. We need to match it with the scripture. And if it doesn't match, forget it or ignore it. We need to recognize that there are false prophets even this day. How many prophets on TV and radio and in books over the last 30 years have I read? And now they're on their fifth prophecy about this is the end. This is the end. Oh, Russia's the end. Oh, no, China's the end. Oh, no. Uh, uh, world uh, global warming is the end. Oh no, this war in Russia is the no. How many chances do they get to get it right? In Bible times, they only got one chance. If you gave a false prophecy, you were a false prophet. Wow, that eliminates a lot of the TV and radio shows I listen to. A lot of the podcasts, doesn't it? But Nehemiah was able to recognize that. He knew that Jesus would be saying nearly 500 years later, watch out for the wolf in sheep's clothing. Nehemiah says, Satan, our enemies, my friends, the prophets, the religious leaders, they are out to get us. And we need to remember then, thirdly, God is bigger than the task he gives us. Don't let the task cause you to be intimidated. Don't let the task make you fearful. Look at what Moses, Daniel, David, Solomon, Esther, and all the others did. But look at especially what Nehemiah did. He recruited the king. He traveled more than almost a thousand miles to go from Babylon to, or uh, Persia to uh, uh, Jerusalem. Took months to do that. And it, 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 show this map of, uh, uh, there we go. Unfortunately, this map isn't big enough, but down in the lower, uh, right in the middle, it says Christ Church Bangkok, and that blue strip down on the bottom is Sathorn Road and the canal out here. So from the corner out here, if you were to walk all the way down Convent to Saladang Soy 2, turn right, go down to Saladang Soy, turn right, and come out on Sathorn and walk back here, that's two miles. That's how much wall. Jeremiah, or Nehemiah, and the people built. It's impressive because they didn't have all the cranes and everything that they have in one Bangkok. But there's nothing as, as exciting as this. Richard, come here. You go that way. These are my friends from Brazil. They didn't know they were going to have to be involved today. The wall. He had a big task, but he had a bigger God. 
He could have been intimidated. He could have been fearful of the task, but he wasn't. It's amazing what he did in 52 days. Now, look at how they did it. How Nehemiah did it. He did it with persistence, consistency, delegating, allowing volunteers to buy into the program, not, not micromanaging them. He had one of the men say to him, uh, Nehemiah, I'll take the wall and repair it from my front door down to the sheep gate. And I'll have my servants and my workers and my friends and my family. We'll take that part. And Nehemiah said, no, I had a different plan for you. No, he doesn't. He says, great. You know why he agreed with this guy? Because if, if my house were being uh, right by the wall, I'd want to know it's secure. I'd want to know it was safe. It was strong. And so he, he allowed them to do this, knowing that they would take pride in their work. Well, he had this vision. They caught the vision. They stayed focused. They stayed on task. They knew their vision, their mission, their goals, their objectives, their strategy. And what happened? At the end of this chapter, and from the rest on, they have these praise meetings and prayer meetings and worship events on this 20 plus foot wide wall. One choir at the top went one way, one went the other. Can you imagine the music uh, that, that they heard around this two mile rectangular uh, uh, wall? God gets the credit. He gives God the credit. Matthew chapter 5, verse 16, Jesus said, you're the light of the world and the salt of the earth. Do these good works so that your heavenly Father will be glorified. Why? Why did he take pride in what he did, even though he wasn't a priest, even though he wasn't a prophet? He knew that his task, first and foremost, was to follow God, be obedient. Our hope and our help this morning is from God, and God is bigger than any task, bigger than any intimidation, any fear monger. Don't let fear and rumors, there's a, one of the translations, a couple of translations actually uses this phrase rumors a number of times here. The Twitter rumor mill, the Facebook rumor mill. <laughs> Even some of our media have become rumor mills, according to the BBC, over the past couple of weeks, and their, their account of what's happened with this uh, interview with Princess Diana. Same thing happened in America a few years ago with our number one newscaster. So we have to be able to be discerning and look beyond that. I have a picture, I did have a picture in my, on my wall in my office in America for a number of years until I gave up my office. It was taken in January 2005 near Calloc on the coast here. I had a group of seven volunteers that had come from America to do rehab and help following the tsunami just one month prior. Our task that few days was to go into Banam Kam, the fishing village that had been half destroyed. Half the residents were never found after that morning. Half survived. So our job that day was to clean out this house that was full of mud and bricks and broken glass and see what repair would need to be done. We noticed that morning a little boy walking back and forth, about eight years old, in front of the, where we were working. He had this sack he was carrying behind his back. His shoulders were slumped, his head was down. But nobody thought anything of it. Our Thai volunteers with We Love Thailand from a church here in Bangkok, they didn't grasp it either. But by afternoon, that little boy had worked up the courage because he heard us laughing and singing and praying. He walked up to the house, 
doors, the windows are gone. And he walked inside. You could see in, the fear in his eyes, in his face. You could see, you know, he was lost. So we ask one of our Thai volunteers, find out what's going on with this little guy. Eventually he confessed. Since the tsunami had hit, his house disappeared. His parents disappeared. His brothers and sisters disappeared. And he had eluded those who, were, who would help him because he was afraid. Fear's an awful thing, isn't it? And so I told the Thai church leader, you must find a home for this little boy. Now our task that morning was to clean out physically that building, to clean it up, prepare it for the family who was hoping to move back in, what family was left. And all of a sudden, a spiritual building of a wall that we hadn't expected was now needed. We had to stop and build around this little boy's life. Sometimes it's okay to get off task and to put the strategy aside when needed. But it's there for a purpose. But that day we knew we had to leave it behind. So how do you overcome fear? How do you overcome intimidation? Jesus says in Luke chapter 10, verse 2, as he sends the 70 out to do mission and ministry, he says, the harvest is plentiful. The laborers are few. Get this. The ultimate strategy, no matter what we're doing for God, the ultimate strategy, pray therefore that the Lord of harvest will send forth laborers. What's the answer to the fear and intimidation? There are a number of things you can see in Nehemiah's life. But the one that stands out in almost every chapter, him, he did it twice in this chapter. He stopped and prayed. Let's do the same. Thank you, God, for this morning, for this time. Be with us. Help us to put prayer at the priority point. Make it the, the, the strategy for every situation and circumstance, the answer to all our fears and to all our tasks that you give us in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Gary. Please uh, stand for the next hymn. And during this time, the offerings of the congregation will be received. Please stand.
be seated. Or if, or if you have better knees than me, feel free to, to kneel during our time of prayer. As we come before our Father in his throne to ask that he may purify us in our hearts and wash away all those things that we've transgressed or cause us to feel stuck. Together, Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have gone our own way, not loving as we should, nor loving our neighbors as ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, and in what we have failed to do. Father, forgive us. Help us to love you and our neighbors and enable us to live for your honor and glory. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Now, I, I would like for everybody to stand uh, as we recite the creed. Creed is an old word we don't really use in everyday language, but these words that we say are true, and it's his promise that he gives to each of us together. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Please be seated. Very good, Very good morning to everyone, and uh, again, welcome to, to Christchurch Bangkok. Great to have you with us. We're just going to share a time of communion now. So please do feel free to, to join in with the words that are, are in bold. The Lord is here. His Spirit is with us. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give thanks and praise. It is right to praise you, Father, Lord of all creation. In your love you made us for yourself. When we turned away, you did not reject us, but came to meet us in your Son. You embraced us as your children and welcomed us to sit and eat with you. In Christ, you shared our life that we might live in him and he in us. He opened his arms of love upon the cross and made for all the perfect sacrifice for sin. On the night Jesus was betrayed at supper with his friends, Jesus took bread and gave you thanks. He broke it and gave it to them, saying, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Father, we do this in remembrance of him. His body is the bread of life. At the end of supper, taking the cup of wine, Jesus gave you thanks and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. Father, we do this in remembrance of him. His blood is shed for all. As we proclaim his death and celebrate his rising in glory, send your Holy Spirit that this bread and this wine may be to us the body and blood of your dear Son. As we eat and drink these holy gifts, make us one in Christ, our risen Lord. With your whole church throughout the world, we offer you this sacrifice of praise and lift our voice to join the eternal song of heaven. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. And let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. And as we prepare in a moment to come forward and to receive bread and wine. Let's, don't know what might you, you might be going through in your particular life, but as you 
have received the bread and received the wine. Ask for Jesus to draw close to you. Ask for Jesus to draw near to you. Ask Jesus to give you a fresh revelation of maybe his love, his, his touch upon your life, his purpose and plans for your life as well. And so if you love Jesus as your Lord and Savior, please do feel free to come forward and uh, receive the bread and wine. Or if you prefer to come forward for a prayer of blessing, that is fine too.
Father God, we just want to say thank you so much for sending your son Jesus to die upon the cross in our place to forgive us our sins, to defeat the power of fear, of death, of sin, of hell in our lives, that we might know the freedom that only Jesus can bring. And Father, thank you that we can walk in freedom with Jesus Christ as our Lord, as our Savior, as our King, and as our God. And I ask and pray, Lord God, that you would strengthen each one of us by the power of your Holy Spirit now as we've prayed and praised and shared together, and as we have also received bread and wine, Lord, remembering all that you've done for us, all that you are doing for us, and all that you will do for us in the future as well. We say thank you from the depths of our hearts, Lord God Almighty. Amen. We sing, All Hail the Power of Jesus' Name. seated. Before I commence with the few announcements we have, I'd like to invite Matthew to come up.
and uh, share with us. Okay, thank you. It's just in fact, on your uh, notice sheets in the orange leaflet that I hope you've all got, uh, you'll see one of the notices is that we are just in the process of advertising for a new uh, children's and youth ministry leader. And so I'd just like to draw that attention uh, to you. Do, do read through that situation um, in, in, the, in the notices. Our children and youth are a really important part of the church, and we really encourage us all to be praying that God will lead the right person to come and work here with us among our children and young people, uh, helping to grow uh, the church and helping to disciple our children and young people. So please do be praying about that. If you know anyone who might be interested in the role, then do give them a nudge. And uh, if you'd like to get hold of a copy of the job description, then you can find that, uh, uh, Oki can, can send that to you. Um, so please be do praying about it. It's a really important um, stage that we're at with our children and youth ministry. And so let's be praying uh, as a church for this, that God will bring the right person to come and join us uh, and to help to lead uh, the younger element of the church as well uh, in all that he has for us here. So I just wanted to draw your attention to that. We'll be advertising it you know, as far and wide as we can, but if you know anyone or know anywhere that you think might be a good place to advertise this particular role, then just read through it, and if you want to know a little bit more about it, come support to me or Chris or Edward or Oki, we can tell you a little bit more. And let's be praying that God will bring the right person. Let me just pray about that right now as we, uh, and then I'm going to hand back to Jeff to complete the rest of the notices. But Father God, we thank you again. We pray every service for our children and young people because they are such an important part of your church, Lord God. And Father, we just lay before you now this role of uh, children and youth ministry leader. And Lord, it's our prayer that you will guide us as a church. Uh, Lord, we help us to do all that we reasonably can, Lord, but we look to you, God, and we want to pray in faith that somehow or other, Lord, you will make the connections that only you can do and that you will just raise up either among us or from within or from outside the right person to take over this, this full-time role uh, of leading the children and youth ministry. So we commit it to you, Lord God. We place it before you. We lay this request, Lord God, at your feet and at the foot of the cross. And we ask and pray that you might hear our prayers, pray to you in faith, and hear and answer us and guide and lead the right person to come and work with us to your praise and to your glory, that we might see your kingdom built up in our church and in this local area to the glory of your name. Amen. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Matthew. Uh, just outside the main entrance of the building here, you will uh, find our welcome desk. And um, if you are new or you're a visitor and you'd like to know more about who we are as a people, or to let us have your contact details so that we can be in touch with you, please do make yourself known at the welcome desk in the back and there'll be some person, a good person here who will reach out and make contact with you. We have a Wednesday Bible study every Wednesday. This takes place in the prayer room at the Christ Church every Wednesday at 1 p.m. If you are interested or like to know more, please contact Shirley uh, at her email address, which if you need that, ask one of us and we'll be happy to give that to you, uh, or Miranda uh, for more information. And also note that the Bible study materials are found also at the welcome desk, along with the contact details uh, for the people that you need to contact to know more about what that is. Uh, we have a revival prayer meeting. It's every Thursday at 12 noon. All are welcome to come and pray uh, for God to move across the city of Bangkok, even across our own hearts, uh, and in the nation of Thailand. Uh, that meeting will be in the prayer room. There is a women's fellowship meeting. Uh, all women are welcome to join. Uh, it is Ju Sunday, July 31st, and that will be at 12 p.m. If there's no other announcements, uh, 
I'd like to close with a closing prayer. But thank you for coming and worshiping with us and hope to see you soon. Holy Father, we collectively we thank you for giving us this time to come together and show you our love, our devotion, and our belief and trust in you and what you accomplished through your Son on that cross, and that the resurrection life goes out to all of us. We ask that you be with each of us as we leave this place of worship, to be on our hearts, to circumcise our hearts to where we have a mind to soak ourselves into your words and your scripture and to find you there and to find you within our own hearts. Be with us, Lord Jesus, as we go from this place. Watch over us. And we ask it in your name. Amen. And the church said, Amen.